Hey guys, how you doing? My name is Mike McCormick. I'm with Advanced Criminology here in Owings Mills, Maryland. Today is Wednesday, August the 29th, 2018. Approximate time on my clock is 10.45, give or take a minute or so. And in the next 15 minutes here in Baltimore, uh, downtown Baltimore Police Headquarters, at 11 a.m., uh, the news media will be meeting with the police commissioner, uh, the new police commissioner, uh, Gary Tuggle, along with the uh, Institutional Review Board, the Investigative Review Board, if you will, uh, in reference to their conclusions drawn uh, about the death of Detective Sean Suda last year. As you know, you guys uh, have been following me since last year, most of you, that uh, uh, I told you in the last video, which was video number three of the series here in dealing with the suicide of the detective. Um, and I'll tell you what, I've had an opportunity, the, the, if you go online, and I'm going to give you a lot of that in this video, so it might be a little bit longer than normal. If you, I, I'll tell you to go online, I'll tell you where these things are so, so you can search for yourself. Um, the, the report, scathing report, if you will, is uh, I believe 227 pages of, of really, really, really extensive uh, work that this particular institutional review board done. Uh, and I tell you what, I'm, in, I'm impressed. Uh, I'm impressed simply because, you know, they went all out, really, to, to come up with what the facts that they had have. Um, and really, the report does this. It does two things. So you get a chance to read it. Some of you might, might be too much of a read for you because it's, a lot of people don't like reading 200 some odd pages worth of text. Um, basically, it's two things. It talks about the conclusions of the, of the investigation itself. But it also criticizes the police department as well. And as you know, this police department has been criticized for many, many years to get their act together. And so a lot of that is in the report. So bear with me because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the highlights and the points that in that, this particular report. And then we're going to look at that. Um, some of you have asked me questions just recently online yesterday and this morning. And I'm going to cover those, those questions uh, in this particular video. So again, this is video number four uh, that deals with the suicide of Detective Sergeant Sudo of the Baltimore City Police Department. So here we go. Uh, we're going to start with the first conclusion. And again, I'm going to, lots of times when you guys listen to me, you got to realize I'm no longer with the police department. I've been away from the police department for over 30 years. Let's, let's, let's make that first point. I have no ax to grind. Uh, there's no there's no reason why I should side with the police department or either either in either direction because I don't benefit in either direction What I like to do is just give you what my past has been in dealing with policing and law enforcement over the years My connections to the police departments, which I still have my connections with the investigative news media in Baltimore Which I still have my connections with some of the institu uh, uh, universities I've attended in the past we have to, I've, I've worked and, 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 and had the pleasure to uh, learn from some people in this business who have taught around the country, if not around the world, who have written books extensively on criminal justice. And, uh, you know, and so I've paid attention. And so lots of times these are the things I'm bringing to, to the table uh, in this particular, in all my videos. Um, and then I'm going to bring, you know, actually, you know, my opinion based upon all of the information I have gathered. Uh, again, I will tell you and you guys who follow me know that I talked about suicide several months ago. I said in the last video. Uh, and so, you know, that's the way I was. Um, again, and, and as they reiterated in the, in the report, that there was more information for a suicide and less information in terms of a third party uh, uh, actually killing the, the, uh, the officer. Um, and then also the, the reference to the Gun Trace Task Force as uh, setting him up to be murdered. And so there was less information on, on those two than it was for suicide. So let's, hit, let's get to the report right here. Again, I'm going to make my points. Um, come back to me with your, uh, certainly with your comments, you always do. Uh, pay attention to the video up in the left hand top corner, excuse me, when you're looking at these videos on YouTube, up on the right hand side you'll see a little, like a little quotation mark, you'll press that and you'll see some other videos related to this video here. And down the bottom, it's going to ask you 12 seconds into the video to subscribe. So if you're new to the channel, you haven't subscribed, I want you to. Again, um, subscriptions is what keeps you updated uh, as well as letting you know uh, what I have coming up next. 
So let's let's uh let's get into this thing. And I appreciate you guys' time to to and patience in this particular video. So let's go. Okay, point number one that was brought out from the IRB was this: a portion of the gun barrel was in contact with Suda's head at the time the fatal shot was fired. Basically, if, and this is what you didn't know, but I knew. I knew this from someone who I who had seen some of the medical reports several weeks, several months ago. That Detective Shooter was a right-handed detective. A lot of you think that this detective was shot here in the side of his head, maybe you know here, or whatever. But he was right-handed, so I'm holding my right hand here. The gun, Detective Shooter, put the gun back behind his ear here, right here. That bullet traveled through here, the backside, as you can see. I'm I'm doing this with my right hand. I'm using this as as, as a trigger right here, in my finger. He, he pulled the trigger here. That's what he did. Because it was a bullet and a bullet traveled through the brain, it hit bone. That bone broke up that bullet, which becomes bullet fragments. And those fragments exited that detective's left eye. You didn't know that. Okay? So I'm putting it out here now. And in fact, they don't even talk about it in, in, the, in, in the report. At least I haven't come over that just yet. Okay? So you need to know that. I attended the funeral services, the open casket funeral services of that detective. I attended it the first the first day of the wake. I was there within, it started at 3 o'clock. I probably was there within a half an hour. I went to pay my respects, but I also went to look at the condition of that officer's body while he lay state in that, in that particular, in his casket. And I saw no visual signs, and I know that a lot of undertakers do a good job with the makeup when it, when it comes time to... Uh, cosmetically fix up people who have been injured uh, you know in, in, in murders homicides or whatever so um, I didn't see anything that way I, way I would see an entrance wound okay and so that was something that illuminated my attention to, to the situation and so that's why for me uh, I, I said okay you know let me let me look at this and process this and then when I again learn learn how the detective committed suicide and the method that he used, Okay, that, that told all I needed to know because I would have saw some physical damage to the detective's front part of his face, but it, but it just wasn't there. Okay, so I'm off of that. Uh, two, Suda is right-handed and the bullet entered the right side of Suda's head. Okay, so they say the right side of his head, but they're not giving you specifically right side of his head. Again, just because it's to the back of your head does not mean that's, that's on the right-hand side, okay? So, just know that that's what, what we're talking about here. Uh, three, the gun, and I'm going to mark these down so I don't get confused. One, two, three. The gun that killed Suda had poly rif polygonal rifling consistent with the Glock, which is Suda's service weapon. As you know, just about all weapons that are manufactured have some type of rifling in it. A rifling is designed to keep the projectile spinning as it travels through the uh, barrel of a, of, a, of a weapon. And so that's what, without getting into details. Now, for you folks who are into guns and ammo who you know NRA buffs and really into the thing you can always comment and give us some more detail about rifling and what the reasons for why rifling exists so rifling was we knew that that the, from the testing uh, from the crime lab that in fact it was his weapon uh, four Suda's DNA was found inside the barrel of the Glock meaning that that weapon was pushed against his head so that when the Projectile penetrated the officer's back part of his head, basically an explosion, and you have the back. The, what happens is that now you have a kind of kind of a, a situation where the the blast itself now comes back towards the uh, officer. Okay, and so that's why you uh, it says here that the uh, part of his DNA was inside that barrel, so you can tell it was pressed pretty hard. Uh, five. The remains of the fatal bullet are consistent with department ammunition. Okay, so they found the projectile part, portion of it a couple days later, and they did the DNA on that and found, and also looked at the the, 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 the DNA, and they looked at the projectile and found that it was it, that service uh, weapon used that, that type of the police department, excuse me, issues those type of ammunition for that type of weapon that, that the officer was using. Uh, let's see. Okay, six. All three spent casings found at the scene, I mean all spent casings that came from Suda's weapon, uh, were found right there, right next to his body. Seven, blood spatter found on inside, and this is really key here, I noted this, blood spatter was found on the inside 
uh, right dress shirt cuff indicating the suit is hand and arm with the same position meaning that if I got a dress shirt on and I got this gun pointed here and here's my cuff right here that when that blast takes off and shoots back towards me okay all the blood and debris is going to get caught up on my arm here okay and then in this, this particular case they found DNA and blood splatter inside the cuff of the detective in the shirt he was wearing that day okay uh, eight Suda was trained, this is important, Suda was trained in self-defense because he spent time in the military, he spent time overseas in Iraq, and he also spent time, on, as we know, 18 years on the police department. So he certainly was trained in self-defense. Um, you can't deny that. It's, it would be hard to believe that a seasoned officer would not put up a struggle uh, with anyone who tried to take his or her weapon. In fact, you're taught that in the military. I spent several years in the Marine Corps and as well as some time on the police department. And you're always taught, never let anybody get a hold of your weapon under any, any and all circumstances. Okay? So that was eight. Nine. Trace amounts of DNA, which may attribute to two officers who carry suit uh, from the, from the uh, murder site and transport him to the hospital, were found on him. Makes sense. These two officers were, came in close contact with Suda to get him out of that area to take him immediately to the emergency room for treatment. Apart from that, they say no other DNA was found. Uh, on his body. 10. The autopsy revealed no defensive, and this is important, no defensive wounds pretty much in every struggle you have. Some, whether you're winning a fight or losing a fight, there's always going to be some type of with, with, uh, marks that uh, are on your, your arms, your hands, uh, and that's what you look for as, as a, as a um, veteran homicide detective. Uh, that's what you would look for. As a, 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 a hospital person, you can look at that and see that that's because you've seen it before with fights that come through the emergency room. And last but not least, the medical examiner found none of that. Okay, And so that's what it says here. The autopsy revealed no evidence of wounds such as abrasion on the knuckles, hands or arms. And Sue was found with his police radio still in his hand, which demonstrate that if you had to let something go to defend yourself, you're not going to let the gun go, but you certainly will let that radio go so you can free up your other hand. And those things are inconsistent with the struggle, okay, which we were told there was a brief struggle. We were told this by the police department that evening and, and throughout the rest of the week. 11. Video from a neighbor's video camera and testimony of two witnesses. They went back and talked to two witnesses, established that the suspect would have only had a couple of seconds to disarm Suter, shoot him with his own weapon, Erase any trace of his presence and exit the vacant lot without being seen or heard in, in broad daylight in a busy area. You know what? This is probably, if I had to look at everything down here, I'm going to say that this is important. I'm going to tell you why this is important. This particular, um, this is number 11. This is important because if you remember, I, I, I went online on this channel several times during this whole investigation and I said, why haven't we received the video? The commissioner's office refused to give us this video because guess what? Any moron can take a video, play it, look at the timestamp on it, uh, and coordinate that with um, Detective Bamenka's statement as to how long the detective gone, how long the detective left him, and then coordinate it again with the radio transmissions to KGA. So when you take all three of those and you combine them together. You come up with eight seconds. And so the board says, well, well, you got to be either Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, all rolled into one to overpower a seasoned veteran, military man, a police officer who's familiar with high crime areas uh, and overpower him in eight seconds. They're right. They are absolutely right. You can't do it. You can't do it. It, it would just be impossible to do eight seconds and this is why we were not given that video because the police department knew that anyone if you study criminal justice if you really want to do your homework could actually come up and say okay if we got the audio if from the radio transmission if we got the information from the detective he, who we was with and we got the video okay we can make that analysis all right and so let's get back to when they asked for the FBI in this case. And I'm just sidetracking for a minute here. 
because the FBI refused to take this case when asked because it's specula speculation out there through reliable sources that say the FBI already knew based upon the information that they had gotten from the Baltimore City Police Department when they looked at the case and they kept it for a couple of weeks before they came back and said no they already knew they didn't want to touch it because they looked at it and they saw it as a suicide that's what's out there just check your local uh, news media here in Maryland and uh, you'll see that that's the reason why they backed off so let me get off of that but that was one of the most important things because now we're talking about a time to disarm an officer get a weapon take his arm shove it up against his head fire three rounds while transmission is going on get out of that area and also I want you to go back and look at that video because you can go to WBAL and Google that video you can go to WJZ in Baltimore Google that video and you will see in the background of that video during the hours that that video is showing you time stamp that is showing you you'll see tons of cars rolling back and forth on Schroeder Street why because guess what I'm born and raised in this city I worked at Western District and I know that's the time that most people get off work from downtown and they use Franklin Street as a major thoroughfare to go back out west from from uh, southwest direction back out northwest direction to go back excuse me I'm, I'm wrong again uh, uh, to go back out into the Route 40 area uh, west so that is a busy thoroughfare okay so that's why you see a bunch of cars in the background at the same time where this officer allegedly killed himself all right so you know it, it just goes to show you that they, they did go back and find a couple witnesses all right what we still don't know and you guys will agree with me because I was asked this question online was about we still don't know if this 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 jacket situation of a white stripe and black jacket even existed I will tell you I'm, I was speculative then I didn't trust the statements that came from the police department then I didn't trust the statements whatever statements Bomega made I didn't trust them and I didn't trust it because as a seasoned police officer that I was working in the high crime area officers don't give partial descriptions they just don't do it so it just didn't make sense to me then and you know what the, the IRB concluded that it didn't make sense either to them moving on let's go to 12 Sudo was scheduled to testify. This is the biggie here. This is where kind of the conspiracy theory theorists out there in, 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 in this world uh, decided that this case was, was strictly a conspiracy case because of Suda's uh, uh, testimony, upcoming testimony to the grand jury. So uh, let me give you that. They say, 12, Suda was scheduled to testify before a grand jury the following day in connection with the BPD gun trace task force corruption investigation okay i'm going to combine that with also uh 13 so 12 and 13 are the same suda was considered a subject of that investigation and another gtf member had implicated suda in criminal wrongdoing now detective suda was implicated in criminal wrongdoing between 2007 and 2010. i discussed this i laid out a video that showed the working relationships of those members of the gun trace task force and detective Souter, I, I did a video I'll, I'll try to connect it with this video here where I showed you how many arrests these guys had made together over a three-year period okay and so the same people that he had worked with who were now facing a, a serious federal indictments and long-term pr prison sentences are the same people he was working with who basically implicated him as a person who was also quote unquote a dirty cop along with them and again this the the scenario that was painted of detective Souter uh, from the police department that he was a stellar and I'm a quote Commissioner Davis that he was a stellar officer the, the only problem with the, the, the commissioner's statement at the time he already knew that the detective was under federal investigation for stealing money he was already under investigation for that the, and the commissioner knew that and that's not a statement that you make about an officer who's already under federal you know investigation uh, for stealing that he is a stellar officer and so in our minds and in the citizens minds in Baltimore we were like oh my god this happened to a guy who's one of the good ones 
on the police department. He's one of the great guys on the police department. He's out there just doing his job. He can't, couldn't possibly be involved with these other guys. Well, if the, 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 at the end of the day, you can't work next to me and make over 175 arrests together and I not know that you're doing something dirty. So either two things, either you turn the other way and condone my behavior or you're part of the problem. And unfortunately, Detective Suda was part of the problem as well. So I'm going to let that go. Uh, 14, which is most damning to the to, to whole case, that Detective Suda had, had, had hired an attorney to represent him at the grand jury hearing the next day, which would have been on the 16th of November, 2017. Uh, all afternoon, his attorney tried to call him and get a hold of him uh, to schedule a time that they could meet that afternoon to go over Suda's testimony the next day. Well, Detective Suda never responded back to his attorney. Trust me, if you have a court case the next day, the, the, you don't want to even talk to your mama. You, so you want to be talking to your lawyer at the end of the day because you need to know what you're up against and what you might be facing when you go into that grand jury. I'll leave that alone. Okay, now a little more discussion here. Where now they talk about, uh, let's see. Let's see the video. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. It says here, and you guys remember this, that initially when the shooting took place, the police department, head, headed by C Commissioner Davis at the time, said that he was shot in the head with his own service revolver and that there was evidence of a but brief but violent struggle and provided a vague description, right? And also at that time it was announced that there was a $215,000 reward. Nobody ever called in to say that they, you know, you had people calling in, but nobody ever, the information they got didn't lead anywhere, okay? Which is uncommon in this city, trust me. When there's a homicide, you get a lot of calls in. It's very, very, very rarely they don't get calls on homicides and can get, you know, good information. So I'm going to leave that, you know, leave that where it is. Okay. In the report, however, the examiner found no evidence of injury to, and this is when they talk about examiner, they're talking about the medical examiner here. They found no evidence to the, to the, to the uh, detective suit's neck, his ribs, or his sternum, his chest. And there's no evidence of any abrasions or bruises, hands, or possible struggle. Now, they will say this, that upon detectives' arrival to the emergency room shock trauma, University of Maryland, that um, they cleaned his hands because that's typical before they do operations that they clean the body. Oh, um, and that's just what they did. So there was no way they could have gotten gun residue from his hands because of that. There, there was, however, residue from the jack, from the, from the shirt that he was wearing but not, not directly from the hands. Okay, again, from, because of that. Uh, and they said here, in a rush to attempt to save his life, um, they cleaned Detective Suda's hands before law enforcement personnel could do the gunshot residue test. Okay, um, I talked about the lawyer trying to reach him. Uh, one and major, major thing here too is this. For someone who wanted to disassociate himself with the gun trace task force, it is alleged that cell phone analysis revealed substantial deletions in the detective cell phone. Suda or someone with access to his phone deleted Gun Trace Task Force defendants Gondo and Ward from his contacts. That's what the report says. In addition, it says that 75 text messages were also deleted with approximately 313 call logs, meaning that he received calls from these two guys. Whether he's receiving them from jail or whether he was receiving them through a third party, um, he or someone deleted those text messages and those calls from, from, from the phone. Keep it moving. Now, you got I, I, I'm This last one here was just perplexing to me. It says also, according to the report, they did a search. Now, the IRB uh, uh, team actually did the search of the detective's home computer. Guess who didn't do the search initially? The Baltimore Police Department never issued a warrant to get, or not, they didn't, they didn't even need a warrant. They could have just went to the house and asked the wife, look, we need to see the uh, detective's computer because we're trying to find out whether or not he might have had contact with some, with some unsavory people that he had arrested or whatever that might have been out to get him. You know, would you please give us a computer so we can look through it? Trust me, she would have gave it to him cheerfully. But they never went and asked for it. Because had they gone and asked for the, the, the computer, 
like the IRB investigators did, they would have found that at least five times on September 6th, just this September 6th, he, he, he uh, Googled Vaughn Green Funeral Home. We don't know what the conversation might have been, uh, but it shows that he searched for Vaughn Green Funeral Home five times on September 6th. And they also say that there are other issues with the computer where searches for, for those types of things took place. Okay? Now, guess where Detective Suda's body was? The, the body I went to go see back when he died, actually after he died. At the same funeral home that he was Googling. The same funeral home, Vaughn Green. Out of all the funeral homes that exist in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, why does Vaughn Green happen to be that the particular a funeral home that eventually the detective end up going to anyway. That's interesting. That's interesting because right when I saw that, I was like, wow. That means that he may have had conversations with the detective. Uh, he may have had conversations with the detective, someone from that funeral home. Or maybe it's even further than that. Maybe with this planning of his suicide, he let other people know not to say anything. We don't know. I'm just speculating. Right now, I'm going to leave this alone. I'm, I, I, I've got another appointment I got to go on. But I think I've covered enough in this video for you guys to really food for, food for thought. And so what I want you to do is go back and look at some of the video, look at the points. Uh, make sure you subscribe as always. And my name is Mike McCormick. I'm with Advanced Criminology here in Owens Mills. I certainly thank you for your time and attention to this particular video. Thank you.